It is, uh, yeah, you can be seated. It is, all, it is always such a blessing to be able to come and to share with you guys. And we kind of see our churches as, as, as kind of sister churches, as God is really doing an incredible work at, at uh, both places. And Daniel really and truly is a good friend. And it's always exciting to come to see what he's doing here. So this is my first time addressing the 8 o'clock service. So welcome, you guys. Uh, all right. All right, so uh, eight, uh, what is it, eight, 10, and 12 now, right? So we'll see what God does here. Would you pray with me? Uh, let's ask God to bless our time, and, uh, and then we'll get into our study. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is deep, it is profound, and it is powerful. It is life transforming, and it gets into the hearts of those who believe and makes changes. And Lord, we say to you this morning that we believe in you. We are yours and you are our God. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. Speak to us, challenge us, encourage us. What a good thing for us to get up, get ready, gather here, present ourselves to you. We also pray that the sense of community in this place, in this service, would continue to grow. Help us to truly get to know one another, love one another, and be there for one another, even as your word says. And we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If uh, the Lord were to tarry, I, I'm not so sure looking around the world today that the Lord is going to tarry very long. But if the Lord were to tarry for another hundred years, I wonder what the church would look like. People are trying all kinds of new things out there, even turning away from the gospel of Christ. Are you guys familiar with the Babylon Bee at all? So it's kind of like the onion. It's a Christian ironic um, webpage, and they have ironic stories. And I, I noticed that there was a, an article on the Babylon Bee this week that said something like this. Um, a senior pastor, after exhausting all ways of making his church relevant, resorts to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> in, the, in the very center of Christianity, and I mean in the very center of Christianity, is the resurrection is the cross of Christ, his death for our sins, the shedding of his blood for our remission, that you and I are adopted into the family of God, and we are given, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, we are given an inheritance. And the amazing thing about the inheritance that you and I have received, it's, it's not just any inheritance. It's not a random inheritance. It's not, Robert, I want to give you an inheritance. Here's the one I planned for you and set aside for you. But the Bible says we share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ. He is like the older brother. He's the only begotten brother. And here we all are all coming in tag behind. We're adopted brothers. We're in the family of God, and we share in his inheritance, and that is absolutely amazing, that Jesus rose from the dead, that he is alive, and because he lives, the Bible says, we live. Jesus said in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. If any of you believe in me, you will not die. And even if you do die, then you will live. I want to share with you a passage out of uh, John chapter 20 today. Uh, I, I'm actually going to start in uh, verse 19 and kind of move through the remainder of the chapter. I added a little bit more. I kind of put my study together and then I decided to back up a little bit and come to Jesus First of all, appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. These are the first words that Jesus spoke to his disciples when he appeared to them and proved himself to them that he had been resurrected from the dead. No one, no one saw the resurrection. That tomb that morning was empty as Jesus got up off of that cold slab and the door had been removed, the stone had been rolled away. Not so that Jesus could exit, by the way, as we're going to see in a minute, but so that the disciples could come in and discover the empty tomb. 
I've often said, and this is so true, that if there's anything that we know for sure, it's that that tomb was empty on that first Sunday morning. If it wasn't empty, the Roman guards wouldn't have done what they did. The enemies of Christ wouldn't have done what they did. The disciples wouldn't have done what they did in, with that empty tomb. But Jesus also began appearing to people. He appeared, first of all, to Mary Magdalene. Remember, she confuses him for the gardener. She says, tell me where you laid his body and I'll take it away. And then Jesus says to her, Mary, calls her by name. And he says, and she turns around and she says, Rabboni. The very next words of Jesus are, stop clinging to me. Which means that she grabbed a hold of his neck. He didn't say, as it says in the King James, don't touchest thou me not. So he said, stop clinging to me, Mary. You gotta let me go. We got stuff that we have to take care of. We've got things that we have to do. We know that Jesus a little bit later on appeared to Cephas, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He appeared to Peter, and then after appearing to Peter, he appeared to two disciples on the Emmaus Road. And then that evening, the remaining 10 disciples, Thomas being absent, the doors being shut, the windows being locked, suddenly Jesus appeared in the midst of them. Let's talk a moment about these eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. They are very important. Since no one was there in the tomb when Jesus was resurrected, it didn't have to be, because all you have to see is the risen Lord to know that he has been risen. And Peter said in one of his books, I am an eyewitness of these things. John also said the very same thing. I'm an eyewitness. We saw him, we handled him, and we experienced this. But, but Peter went on to say that we have the more sure word of prophecy because we don't expect this place with these doors shut for Jesus to all of a sudden appear in the midst of us and say, handle my hands, handle my side. Now, God can do whatever he wants to do. And if he wants to do that with us this morning, we'd be more than willing, <laughs> wouldn't we, to, to have that kind of an encounter with Jesus. But we see that God has given us something that can stir us up, that can help us to know if you are struggling with doubt, that, that the Lord has given us something we can look at to have confidence in the commitment that we've made with Christ. As a young girl, she had been brought up in the church. Her, uh, uh, in fact, she was born into a Christian family. She'd grown up, her mom, an incredibly godly mother who had cared for her whole life. She began to go to the U of A, which is the University of Arizona, in Tucson. And when she went there, the professors began to kind of mock and tease, make fun of Christianity the way that they do. I don't know that every, every uh, professor does that, but I'm gonna say this, a lot of them do. I understand them wanting to challenge people to think for themselves, not just to receive what they've received from their parents, but to really think for yourself and come to own what you own. I believe that with teaching, by the way, too. I believe that in teaching the scriptures, that you guys aren't just supposed to come and be these blank slates that absorb anything that's said, but these things need to become your own. They need to be owned by you, these principles that we find in the pages of scripture. So she began to struggle with some doubts. Is Christianity really true? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Are the scriptures really reliable? She, she had told her mother that she was having these doubts, and her mother responded with, well, that's the devil, which to some degree probably was, right? The enemy's attacking. We know that he's always attacking us. And she kind of said, that's the devil. You just need to not really give in to this. Well, I talked to that girl not long after that, and she told me the struggles and the difficulty that she was having. This was indeed for her. She, she wasn't disbelieving, but it was a crisis of faith for her. She was wondering, are these things real, and am I really living my life for Christ? And I told her, I struggle with doubts too. I've had my doubts. A little bit later on, she would tell me, that took me so by surprise. The last thing that I ever thought to hear a pastor say was, I struggle with doubts too. And I took her back over certain prophecies. Specifically, the one I chose there was Psalms 22, a first person account of a crucifixion hundreds of years before crucifixion was ever invented. Psalms 22 starts out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. 
which we know that Jesus said on the cross as it got dark there, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms 22 ends with he has done this or the Hebrew equivalent to it is finished, to tell us die. And what we see there in Psalms 22 is not only a first person account of a crucifixion, they pierced my hands and my feet, all of my bones are out of joint. This is a thousand years before Christ, hundreds of years before crucifixion is invented. And, and let me just ask you this question. How do you have a first person account of a crucifixion? Because people die when they are crucified. How do they ever come to the point where they share what they have seen? And it's amazing when you compare Psalms 22 to the crucifixion of Jesus and see that God had it all planned out. It was enough again for her. I went over a few other passages, but it was enough for her to say, I trust in what God says, and I truly do believe him. We're going to be looking at the words that Jesus says to his disciples, the very first words uh, after his resurrection. After he had appeared to Mary Magdalene, we don't know. We know what he said there. We don't know what he said to Cephas. We know what he said to the two on the Emmaus road. We also know that, by the way, that Jesus appeared to the women that went to the tomb early. When they looked in and they saw the two angels, and the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. That as they made their way back, Jesus appeared to them as well. They showed up with the 10 disciples. Of course, Peter had seen the Lord, and they said, we've seen Jesus, he's alive. What did the 10 disciples do? Ah, bunch of women, ah, we don't believe you at all. And they wouldn't let themselves believe. In fact, I want to point out that every single one of the disciples, except perhaps for John himself, had some kind of doubt. The Bible says that on that early morning, John and Peter ran to the grave. And John says, and I outran Peter. He just wants you to know. Typical, typical guy. I got there first. I beat him to the, to the tomb. And, and then it says that he saw the grave clothes laying there and the linen cloth that was around his head folded up separately. And the Bible says, and John saw and believed. When John was there in that tomb, he looked and he believed. Every one of the other disciples had doubt, even all the way into the Great Commission, when John brings them up on a high mountain in the book, into the book of Matthew and says to them, go out into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. And it says, and the disciples were gathered together, and some doubted. Isn't that crazy? They're experiencing, they're seeing the risen Lord. They're receiving the work that you and I are to go and do. And yet some of them had some doubts. Now, as we look at this, we find, first of all, in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, not Monday, right? When the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. The last words are, are always important. If, if someone knows that they're dying and they give their last words, we know that there is something that is significant that is said. First words are important too, although they're not always that significant. I saw that the most common word for a baby, first of all, you guys have any idea what this is? The most common word for a baby, very first word that ever speaks is dada. Sorry, moms. You put in all that time. It just seems to be a little bit easier for the baby to say dada. And then mama comes short after that. You know what the other two uh, words that they say first that are in the top 10? There's not only mama, there's not only dada, but there is no which how many times have you told a baby no by a year, right? No. And this one is interesting too. The word mine is in the top 10. Mine. We got to think, where does the baby learn the word mine? How many times does a mom and a dad, when his dad is sitting with the remote control on the baby and the baby reaches the remote control, mine, 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 yours, yours, mine. When, can you imagine your baby's first word? Mine. Mine, it is mine. It reveals the sin nature and a couple of things that we say that enough to our babies that it could be their first words. Well, when Jesus gathers together here with his disciples, the first words that come out of his mouth are extremely important. And he says to them there, peace be with you. 
Jesus had said, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Have you ever experienced that supernatural peace, that strange peace? Anybody can have peace when life is good. When you're in a season where, where there's sunshine and sunsets and joy, those are, those are great seasons of life. But, but I've come to say life turns on a dime. And life can take a, a direction that is unexpected at any time. And I have experienced peace when I shouldn't have peace when I'm going through circumstances that are devastating and life-changing, and there is that strange peace that is there that helps us to know that even though I might be going through the ringer right now, God is with me. And as Jesus shows up, I'm sure he had to say peace. These guys, their, their Savior, their Lord, has been crucified. Even Mary Magdalene said on the morning that she saw him, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where he's at. She still confessed him as Lord even after he was crucified. And now suddenly Jesus stands in the middle of them. First of all, I gotta say, I wonder how Jesus thought, how am I gonna do this to let him know I'm coming? Because all of a sudden if somebody shows up in a room and the doors and the windows are locked, you're probably going to be terrified and scream as loud as you can. I often think about that when I think about Zechariah entering into the temple when he's won his lottery and he now gets to go into the temple as one of the priests. And he walks in and Gabriel the angel is there. And I wonder if Gabriel said to Michael before, watch this. You know, I wonder how, he, I wonder if he kind of made some noise to kind of let him know I, I'm here. He says something very similar to Zacharias. He says, don't be afraid. Probably Zacharias Zachari is very old, probably afraid he's gonna have a heart attack. Okay, calm down. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a big, I'm a big angel, I understand. So Jesus appears in the midst of them, and the first thing he says is, peace to you. And I think that there was power with those words. I think it brought peace into the midst of them and helped them to understand that no matter what they go through, they are gonna be experiencing a peace. Isaiah 53 is one of those passages in the Old Testament that is full of prophecies about the death, the suffering of Jesus, the life of Jesus. One of the things that it says there is he was chastised for our peace. Can you think of that section? It, it says that he has bore our sorrow and our grief. Uh, by his stripes we are healed. And for the chastisement, or he was chastised for our peace. You know what the word chastised means? It could be translated, he was beaten for our peace. When they arrested Jesus there in the garden, they had a Roman guard with them, which didn't mean just one Roman guard. It meant several, could have been a large number. They had Jewish guards who were there as well. The Jewish guards at this point took control of Jesus. They brought him to Annas, the high priest, first of all, and then they took him to Caiaphas. And the Bible says that as he was arrested by Annas and brought into the courtyard, that while Jesus was there, he was being beaten. When Peter had denied him and looked across that courtyard, he saw Jesus who had already received blows, the beard being plucked out of his face already. And from that moment on, as he went to Annas, as he went to Caiaphas, as, as they had their early morning trial, it even says that when the Sanhedrin found him guilty of blasphemy, because remember they said to him, are you the son of God? And Jesus says to, to Caiaphas, it's as you say. And from here on out, you're gonna see the son of man coming in the clouds of glory. Well, you and I might miss there is that's a quote from Daniel chapter seven, when the son of man comes and receives his kingdom forever. He was telling him, I am a king. And, and that he would one day sit on that throne forever and ever. So he received a beating all the way until he was scourged. And then even as he carried the cross. And we wonder, why? If his death on the cross was our atonement, if our sins were forgiven by his death on his cross, then why was Jesus beaten that entire night? He had his peace robbed from him that night so you could have a supernatural peace. Just as he took your sins on the cross, he took your he took your peace being taken away on that cross. And you and I receive peace now because of that. 
And so the first thing he says to them is peace to you. And when he had said these things, he showed his hands and his side, and his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And that's probably one of the greatest understatements in all of the pages of Scripture, right? They handled him. And notice that they didn't do anything that Thomas isn't going to do either. They felt his hands, they felt his side, and they were glad. Jesus told them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now Jesus breaks into exactly what they need to be doing, and that is to share their faith. As I have been sent by the Father, I send you out. You and I have received that kind of a commandment from the Lord as well. We have the Great Commission. We are continuing it. I love that the Bible says in, uh, in Mark, go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And if you look up that word creature, you know what it means? Every creature. It doesn't even say go out and preach the gospel to every person. Because there might be a person that you and I would go, I think everybody should hear the gospel, but not that person. That person is outside of hearing the message of the gospel. Jesus says preach to every creature. When's the last time your cat heard the gospel? When's the last time your dog heard the gospel? Uh, in South Bay, at Calvary Chapel, there was a pastor named Steve Mays. He's since gone on to be with the Lord now. But uh, Steve wanted to preach for a long time and didn't have an opportunity to. And, and he tells the story of backing his truck up to a turkey ranch. The turkeys would think they were being fed, and they would run all around his truck. And he would practice giving his messages he had prepared to turkeys. And then he would add on, and I'm still preaching to turkeys today. He would kind of just throw that out for the people that were there. But that's a literal fulfillment of preaching the gospel to every creature. Now, being serious, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And you don't light a light to put it under a basket. When he light lit you, when you shine for Christ now, you shine for a reason. And I mean every person in here. In reality, there are some of you here that are gifted in evangelism. There's some of you here that are great in sharing your faith, and that is awesome. There's others of you that are not so good at it. You're gifted in other ways, other things that God has given you. But that doesn't mean that you don't shine as a light for him. I believe that we do more for God than we could ever possibly imagine. I believe that everywhere we go, God is using us in the spiritual realm to touch lives. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come unto me and drink. And out of you is going to gush rivers of living water. And thus he spoke of the Holy Spirit that would be given. This means in the spiritual realm, everywhere you go, out of you is gushing these, this, these, this living water into the lives of people around you. Even when you don't realize it, God is at work. And you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we have been encouraged to go out. We've been sent by him to do the work that God's called us to do. Simply make yourself available. Lord, open up the doors for me to be able to share. I, I, I like to say it's really hard to force the doors open sometimes. You decide you want to share the gospel. Somebody's talking about their car. And you say, yes, but have you ever given your life to Jesus? You really want to work with the Holy Spirit in what God has called you to do. And if you are available, I believe that God will open up the doors. If you understand your calling, who you are in Christ, and what he has for you. One of the very first things, that, in, in fact, the first instruction Jesus gives to them is to send them out to do the work that God has called them to do, to preach the gospel. It won't be the last commission that he gives them, but he gives it here. And in order so that they will know that they are not by themselves, he says in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, a couple of things about that passage. First of all, when he breathed on them, I'm sure it wasn't as as strange as what it might be if you and I gathered in a room and one of us decided, I'm going to breathe on you all. 
we'd be like, thank you, no. I, I, I'll pass if it's possible. Just let me go ahead and pass from, from you breathing on me. But Jesus breathed on them and said to receive the Holy Spirit. Now we also know that he tells them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you will shall receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So he is now giving them the power that they need to be able to do the work that God has called them to do. And as he breathes on them, I believe that they receive the Holy Spirit here. I also believe that they receive the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. I think this is the point when the Holy Spirit moves inside of them. But notice immediately that he brings up a passage that's a little bit difficult for us. The sins of any that you retain or retain, the sins of any that you forgive are forgiven. Like we have the power to walk around people and if we don't like them or we get mad at them, you still have your sins, buddy. Jesus gave me that power. Or that we could just say to somebody randomly, your sins are forgiven you. Obviously, it's not talking about randomly walking through the streets, picking out people to forgive sins and picking out people not to show them their sins. The Bible tells us that you and I have been empowered to do the work that God has called us to do. And we have been given the keys to the kingdom. Jesus said to Peter, you are, you are Peter, Give, kind of gave him a new name, which is the name Rocky, right? And he said, and on this rock I will build my church. He didn't mean Peter, he meant himself. He said, you are Peter, and on this Petra, he used a different word, I will build my church. On this rock, this foundation, I will build my church. And then he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. We have been guaranteed success in this work that we've been called to do. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. The gates of hell don't have legs. The gates of hell are stationary. You and I have legs. This building isn't the church. You're the church. And then the Bible guaranteed that you would have success as you go out and share with Christ. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. People are going to give their lives to Christ. And then you've been given the keys of the kingdom. Jesus said to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. I was out not long ago with a guy who didn't know the Lord. He knew I was a pastor, and we were talking a little bit. And, and he said, to me, I said something to him. I don't even remember what I said. And he said, well, keep working on me. Maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll give my life to, however he said it, maybe one day I'll be a Christian. And, uh, and I said to him, I have the keys to the kingdom. I can let you in. We've all been entrusted with how People are saved. If you believe in Jesus, if you receive him, as John 1.12 says, as your savior, it says to him that, that to them that receive him, he gives the power to become a child of God, even to those who believe in his name. I like to say that some of you guys, some of you guys aren't even entrusted with the keys to your house because you've lost them too much. And God has given you the keys to the kingdom of God. And there is none of you who cannot let people in. So that when someone comes and they say, I want to receive Christ. And they pray a prayer that you can say, your sins are forgiven you. And if someone says, I, I don't want to receive Jesus. I don't want to live for him. I want to go to church, but I don't want to, I don't want to receive Christ. Then you and I can say, then your sins are are not forgiven you. Not because you have a special power, but because we know how to get into the kingdom of God. Because we have been given the keys to the kingdom. Now, it goes on to say in verse 24, now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. <laughs> That's a real drag too for Thomas, isn't it? I, I love that when Jesus shows up, Jesus doesn't chide Thomas. Where were you last Sunday? You missed out on a great, I came and appeared to the disciples last Sunday and you missed out on it. I also love that in the next chapter, John 21, that Jesus doesn't bring up Peter's sin. Isn't that awesome? He doesn't sit down with Peter and go, now I told you you were gonna deny me. He sits down with Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Isn't that great? The Lord's not pointing out any of our sin here today. Our sin is forgiven. He's simply saying, do you love me? 
wherever Thomas was, whatever he was going through, whoever he had gone to on that first night where he wasn't with his community, the community of the disciples, the community of believers, Jesus doesn't chide him at all. So it says that Thomas wasn't there. Then verse, uh, verse, well, the middle of uh, verse 25, right? It says, um, it says that Thomas was not there in the verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see the hands and the prints of the nail and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said once again to them, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. Thomas, as I said earlier, didn't ask for anything that the other disciples hadn't seen. But Thomas refused to believe them. Jesus had said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. So it's not a matter of great faith, although there were people that Jesus encouraged because of their great faith. You remember there was this Roman centurion and there was a Gentile woman in Tyre. Jesus, one of the only places he ever left Israel was to go to Tyre of Tyre and Sidon. And when he was there, a woman began to follow and beg that she would be helped. And Jesus refused, but she stayed with it. And she said, even the puppies receive from the scraps that fall from the table. And Jesus said of that woman, I have not seen as great a faith in all of Israel. There was a persistency there. And you remember the centurion said, just say the word. I'm a man of authority. You're a man of authority. Just say the word. And I know that my servant will be healed. He trusted and he believed what he would do. Now, Thomas doesn't have enough faith to believe unless he actually handles it and sees it. And he is destined to be one of the few that have that eyewitness account of Jesus, which we got to admit would be awesome if Jesus would indeed appear to us. But what does it mean to have a little bit of faith? And what does it mean to have a great amount of faith? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means as we learn the Bible, as we study it, that we believe it and we act upon it. That is faith. If you don't have much faith and you act hesitantly on something, it still is faith. I love in Hebrews chapter 11, when, 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 and, and next time you read it, sit down to read Hebrews chapter 11 and notice that Paul starts in depth talking about saints of old. He gets to Abraham and he spends a ton of time on Abraham. He gets to Moses. He spends a ton of time on Moses. And he's going to go through the history of the Jews and talk about faith and all of that, the Old Testament passages. But then he runs out of time. He's like a preacher that suddenly looks up and sees, I don't have much time left. And so he starts rapidly firing through them. And he says that the children of Israel showed faith when they passed through the water of the Red Sea. You know the story. The army comes in behind them. They're pinned up against the Red Sea. And Moses starts to pray. And God says to Moses, stop praying, which I love. Stop it. It's time to move now. It's not time to pray. We always think it's time to pray. He stops him. And then he, and he says, lift up your staff. And Moses lifts up his staff. And the Red Sea parts. And I always picture those people standing there looking at the Red Sea. And if you watch any of the movies, they rush right in. I'm not so sure I would. Moses says, go and be delivered. And I'm like, you go and be delivered. <laughs> there's water standing on each side. Let's just imagine there's a person there that's hesitant. They kind of look at a fish flopping down in the middle there. They're looking up at the water. And they don't want to get, you know, killed by the army of Egypt. But they don't quite necessarily have the guts to rush out into the middle of where there was water a few minutes ago. But somebody, a few people behind him says, I'll go. And he takes off and runs down there. And somebody else is somebody else. And finally, the guy that was hesitant, he goes. He makes it to the other side. Now tell me, there was one that was hesitant. There was one who was doubting. And there was one that was incredibly confident 
which one of them were delivered by their faith? Trick question, right? Both of them were. It didn't matter how much. Sometimes we mistake faith for confidence. It's not confidence. It's the willingness to go, I put my trust in you. I I think of the guys that by faith kept the Passover. They killed a lamb that had been in their house for, for a couple of weeks or seven days or whatever it was. And then they smeared the blood on the doors. One of them could have gone, I'm really repulsed by this. First of all, I love this little lamb. It's like a pet now. Secondly, I'm going to smear blood on the doors of my house. And so he finally decides, all right, fine. I do, I do love my oldest. Remember, the death angel was going to come take the firstborn. So I'll go ahead and smear it there. And he does it maybe a little bit out of disgust. And he does it not really believing that it's going to happen. His next door neighbor really loves his firstborn takes that lamb and kills it with that hesitancy and smears the blood on the doors and does so with total faith and not questioning God at all. And answer me this question again. Which one of those two did the death angel pass over? Both. It doesn't matter. That's what the idea of faith the size of a mustard seed is. Billy Graham went to be with the Lord not that long ago. And and I love that that. He struggled with the word of God at one point. He struggled with inerrancy. He struggled with the authority of scripture. As he puts it, his own words. I struggled with the authority of scripture. And after a while, he went out into the woods. And I've heard him tell this story here recently. He went out into the woods and he found a tree stump. And he opened up his Bible and he put it on the tree stump. And he knelt down on the ground before that tree stump and his Bible. And he said, God, I don't know about all these questions I have. But I trust you and I believe in you, and I will preach what is in the pages of these scriptures. He made a commitment. Even though we had some struggles, even though we had some questions, he made a commitment. Sometimes we think that believing has to be this overwhelming confidence. But believing is when you weigh things and you look at them and you go, I am going to enter into where the Red Sea is. I'm going to put the blood on my doorpost. I'm going to receive Jesus as my Savior, and I am going to believe in him. And God meets you there, and God does a work inside of you. And if somehow there are those of you that are here today, and like the, the young girl that I talked about who was in college, maybe you've got certain struggles, but God's given us those Old Testament prophecies. Jesus fulfilled over 350 of them in case one, two, three, four, five wasn't enough to show you that these things did not happen by chance to give you enough confidence that you could say, I believe Jesus went on to say, and we'll finish this text up here. Jesus went on to say, um, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, which is one of the great confessions in all of the pages of scripture, right? My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. He knew that generations were going to follow. And we were going to hear of the eyewitnesses of those who saw Jesus. But we would be having our own experiences, never seeing him and yet believing in him. Having our sins forgiven and being used by him. Paul, uh, John goes on to say why he wrote this book. He says, and these and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Stand with me, would you? Let's pray together.